I kind of like you guys being here so often now, you know that? You've grown on me. So what's the crack? Welcome back to another Warhammer 40k video. That's right, more 40k content. Ladies and gentlemen, today's video is a special one and it is done not by Bricky. This is done by somebody else known as Wes Hammer because today we are going to be checking out the Warhammer 40k timeline. Yes, everything I need to know about the events that unfolded in the entirety of the Warhammer 40k timeline. From the beginning of the Horus Heresy to wherever it ends. I don't know. Make sure you go check out his channel if you have not already. This is my first time going to be exploring his channel and I'm excited to check out this video. And Wes Hammer, I'm sure you do an excellent job considering this video has got 3.9 million views. You're doing a great service to all of us noobs to the Warhammer 40k world. Thank you so much for watching the videos as of late. I really appreciate it. I just want to show my appreciation by giving you guys more Warhammer 40k related content and of course more Space Marine two is on the way anyway that being said let us sit back relax and go on a trip into the warhammer 40k timeline by the end of this video you're going to know everything there is to know about the warhammer 40k timeline hell so, yeah let me explain but first if you're unfamiliar with 40k it's this super dark science fantasy franchise where humanity is ruled over by the bloodiest regime imaginable and religious dogma and beset on all sides by voracious aliens heretics and literal demons it's kind of like the exact opposite of Star Love Trek, where Star Trek's all about peace and love and hope. And 40K is like, nah, fuck that. We tried that. In the <laughs> grim darkness of the far future, there is only war. But it's also super intimidating now. for new people to get into. There's over 400 novels, not to mention 30. 400? There's 400 novels. 400. Wow. 30 years worth of lore. And as somebody who's read over 100 of those novels, most wow. of those events, all being important, don't really contribute to you knowing what's going on in the franchise. So today we're going to take the entirety of the 40k timeline and boil it down to just the basics. Just those critically important time periods that you need to know about in order to understand 40k. Because if I was to... So this particular timeline that we're going to be reacting to today by Wes Hammer is a much more condensed basic understanding of the timeline of all of the more important events that have happened throughout the entirety of 40k i like that because i know and i know lots of people tell me because this this franchise is full like and i mean jam-packed with so many different stories from side stories all that stuff like there's so much stuff and so many things and so many different events that happen throughout the entire warhammer 40k lore that it can get extremely overwhelming so it's nice to have videos like this that give me a much more um simpler understanding of the major events that have happened throughout warhammer 40k that everybody that wants to get into this should know so that's that huge thumbs up to you already wes hammer i'm excited try to explain the plot of all of those books in order we would we would be here for like 10 hours so with all that out of the way right, let's okay. dive in where the timeline truly begins 60 million years ago with the war in heaven the war in heaven and its surrounding events can arguably be said is where the timeline of 40k begins so this is essentially the necron war right when the necrons decided to rise up against the old ones with the help of the star gods and yeah let's let's just see what see what he says understand this we need to know about the necrons and the old ones you see before the necrons became the undead metal robots that we know in the 41st millennium they were a species known as the necron tier most records on this time are unfortunately incredibly fragmentary and what we do know is mostly derived from ancient eldar myths and legends a species who's famous for speaking in 99 percent metaphors and one percent facts so you have to take all of it with a little bit of a grain of salt the necron tier were a frail okay. and dying people they lived next to a super radioactive sun that caused cancer to run rampant through their society. They were, however, incredibly tenacious and refused to give up. They sent their people out into space to find new homes and were ultimately successful, populating many new planets. However, the curse of their homeworld would inevitably follow them into the stars, and generation after generation would still be afflicted with terrible radiation sickness. 
Now, all hope seemed lost for the Necron tier, but that all changed when they encountered an incredibly advanced alien species known as the Old Ones. Their technology was absolutely insane, and they seemingly had unlocked the secrets to immortality. Now, the Old Ones' primary goal was to seed life throughout the galaxy, placing microscopic organisms on barren worlds across the cosmos that would later develop into fully sentient species. And it's even rumored that the Old Ones played a role in the development of our own species. When the Necron tier encountered the Old Ones, they begged them for help. But unfortunately, the Old Ones would end up refusing them. Now, they were sympathetic. So I find this stuff really fascinating because there's so many different beliefs on, you know, how we got here, you know, our huma humanity and human race and our species, like how we ended up on Earth. Like there's always these different theories and stuff on how we actually got here. And one of the theories is always like a, an higher, higher beings or beings of a, a greater celestial light planted us here and it, it, it essentially in their image in a way and that's how we came to be now obviously there is far more scientifical and logical explanations for why humans are here on earth and that's whatever and you can believe that if you want to also but it's uh, it's always interesting to see what other beliefs are out there and one of them is is something like this so i can see like those beliefs have kind of been put into this as inspiration, if you will. But I think that's so cool. I like that. Medic to the Necron Tears plight, but basically told them that their fate was their own and they were the masters of their own destiny and that the old ones just didn't want to get involved. Now this infuriated the Necron Tear and they declared war on the old ones. And this went about as well as you could expect it to. Yeah, they lost. The Necron Tear were nowhere near as capable as the old ones and basically got stomped into the dirt every single time they attacked. Now, this yep. would all change when the Necron discovered a new species known as the Catan, who were basically giant, formless, star-sucking vampire star gods that were masters of the physical universe. Each and every one was a wielder of absolutely godlike power, and they told the Necron Tear that they also had a deep-seated hatred of the Old Ones. And if the two species were able to form some kind of- I, w w I wonder why, though. I, I like- for me personally, like where it all began is the, probably the most fascinating before obviously all the events of Warhammer 40k, but w this whole thing that happened at the beginning with the Necrons and the old ones and the Star Gods, I, I find that so incredible. Like this, this, how it all starts is so fascinating. And I think it's a great way if they were ever to do a live action movie, this would be a nice story to tell. You know, give us the origin of it all. Uh, it doesn't have to be the full length of the movie as being this, but tell this story and tell it well and use some beautiful visuals. Um, because the visuals that you use are in this video are, you know, I'd love to see that in live action form. It would just be so cool. They would be able to work in tandem and wipe out their ancient enemies. And if this wasn't good enough, the Catan also promised the Necrons the secrets to immortality. Their people would not know another day of suffering. And this sounded too good to be true for the Necron tier, and that's because it kind of was. You see, yeah. this immortality would take the form of their physical bodies being burned away, and an engram copy of their consciousness being downloaded into robotic mechanical skeletons. Their new bodies were made out of this miraculous metallic substance known as Necrodermis, an incredible living metal that had the ability to repair itself. This was a substance living that was metal? originally wow. developed by the Necron tier and had been used in most of their starships. Not oh, only was see. it incredibly durable, but it offered a lot more protection than their flesh bodies, and their warriors could regenerate from any wound that didn't completely obliterate them. This whole process was known as biotransference, and the entire species was subjected to it. Now, this was the day that the Necron tier species died, confined to the halls of extinction, and in their place was simply the Necrons. Now, together, the Necrons and the Catan would strike back against the old ones, and their combined might was enough to put them on the same level. Harnessing the Catan's limitless energy, the Necrons were able to make weapons of inconceivable power. The war between the Necrons and the Old Ones was the largest the galaxy had ever seen. It spanned from the galaxy's core all the way to the Galactic Rim. Now, during this war, there was a point when the, the Necrons Galactic suddenly The Galactic Rim? Like there's an end to the galaxy? Is that, what, is that what you're saying? Because, you know, from, from anything that I've seen, whether it's like movies, um, stories, like even like real world stuff like the galaxy never ends you know there, there's no end to the universe but maybe maybe the galactic rim is like the galaxy that they're in because i know there's multiple galaxies it gets really complicated i know but that, I, I i don't know something about that just made me think a little bit realized that they had been tricked by the Catan, and the Catan had used biotransference in order to separate them from their souls which they then subsequently devoured 
Needless to say, the Necrons were pretty pissed and retaliated by attacking and destroying the individuals they once worshipped as gods, shattering them into thousands of pieces and binding each of these shards into what were known as Tesseract Vaults, and then subsequently tesseract used these vaults. shards nice. as weapons. It was around this time that the Old Ones created two new races to help fight against the Necrons. The Orcs these and the Eldar. The orcs and the Eldari, one being massive hulking brutes that were the ultimate physical specimens, while the others were master psychers, Every single one being in tune with the warp and able to bring about enormous ruination by channeling its power with their mind. So I just want to take a moment to point out that at this point in the timeline, we have a race of vaguely Egyptian ghosts trapped inside robot skeletons fighting against an entire race of psychic alien god frogs who have created a race of space wizards and space orcs in order to fight the undead robots. 40k can get pretty wild sometimes. Now the devast- But that's why it's so cool. Not just the old ones, the necrons, the Eldari, and the orcs, but there were tons of other civilizations that were living peacefully in the galaxy as well. And they all ended up getting caught in the crossfire at one point or another. And this war spanned millions of years. So the amount of untold destruction and lives lost is truly uncountable. And the warp isn't just called the Sea of Souls for nothing. It's where the souls of sentient creatures go when they die. So the amount of angry and terrified souls that were lost in this war started flooding into the warp in mass. And this would have some very particular ramifications, but we'll circle back to that in a second. Now, it was around this time that the Necron started experimenting with Blackstone, an incredibly bizarre material that has the ability to either channel and amplify the energies of the warp or nullify it completely. So the Necrons built massive spires made out of Blackstone and placed them on thousands of worlds across the galaxy. Hundreds of thousands of years later, these would be known as the Blackstone Pylons. Now, the Necron's original purpose for these isn't really stated, as their major significance to the storyline wouldn't really become apparent until around the time of the Black Crusade, but I'm getting ahead of myself. As creatures solely of the physical universe, with no ability to manipulate the warp themselves, fighting against a race that was all about psychic powers, it's pretty easy to assume that the Blackstone pylons were meant as a defense network, as negatively charging their energy could create a massive nullified area of space-time where psychic powers couldn't be utilized. And this would serve as a powerful defense network against their enemies. So it's at this moment during the War in Heaven when the warp becomes incredibly important to the storyline. Up until this point, the Immaterium or the Sea of Souls had been a rather tranquil place. You see, the warp is a mirror universe, a reflection of our own, but it's a realm of emotion rather than tangible substance like that found in the physical universe. Now, there had been sentient species across the galaxy for a pretty long time at this point, and there had certainly been wars and hatred and anger and all of those negative emotions, but they had never existed quite on this scale. A single planet that has a bunch of people that can't really get along and a bunch of negative feelings isn't quite the same thing as a galaxy-spanning war. And the absolute massacre of an inconceivable amount of people across the entire galaxy for a massive period of time caused the warp to become incredibly unstable. The peaceful creatures that lived in the Sea of Souls were twisted into horrifying nightmares. And during the event- So, wow, okay, so they weren't always monsters. So that like the, the the constant war and death by the gigantic scale of death and war and just outrageous mind blowing stuff because of all of those energies entering the warp at such a rapid pace in huge volumes it it caused the the souls there to turn into demons I didn't catch that part before I don't know if Bricky mentioned that before but so the warp was wasn't always filled with monsters. Wow. Events of the war in heaven, the warp became the realm of chaos. And if that wasn't So the warp became the realm of chaos. Okay, I'm trying to I'm trying to recollect what I've been told already. I think and it makes sense because like, I'm going back to Bricky's video and he did mention because of all of this war and death, it did cause chaos, hence why it's called that now. But I don't remember him mentioning that it was more of a, a peaceful place. That's insane. Bad enough. The psychic allies that the Old Ones had created for themselves, who were directly acting as conduits for the warp, would end up tearing holes in reality and causing what was known as the Enslaver Plague. Massive amounts of these warp-born monstrosities known as enslavers ripped into our universe and spread out across the cosmos, devouring any sentient life they could find. They flooded into the Old Ones' bastions, drawn to them like moths to a flame. The Old Ones in their weakened state were in no position to fight them off, and it is believed that they went extinct. 
Now, admittedly, everything gets kind of blurry here, and we're not 100% sure what exactly happened to them. But after the war had concluded, what? Really? the Necrons were left in a fractious state. They had taken inconceivable losses, and the Eldari had risen to power and were slowly expanding and taking over the galaxy. If the Necrons had tried to fight them after an all-out war with the Old Ones, they more than certainly would have perished. So the Silent King ordered them to go to sleep within their tomb worlds and set the timer for 60 million years. He believed that by this point the Enslaver Plague would have run its course, and would have dissipated back into the warp. Also, the Eldari surely would have died off by then, and whatever species was left over to inherit the galaxy wouldn't be ready for the godlike creations of the Necrons, who would then reclaim what was rightfully theirs. Now the time between- So, currently now, in the lore, the Necrons are still asleep. Whoa. Where's this story going, dude? Where, where, where is this? Where's the timeline going to go, dude? How far is it going to go? 65 million years. It's crazy. In the war in heaven and the rise of humanity is a time mostly dominated by the Eldar who were left to inherit the galaxy after the war had concluded. They knew a time of peace like no other, as every other sentient species had no hope of challenging them. So they could pretty much do whatever they wanted. Now, here's the thing about being immortal and having no wars. To oh, here we go. This is where shit's gonna get weird again. To fight. You got a lot of free time on your hands. So the Eldar got really into the arts and other leisure activities, pursuing pleasure instead of violence. Now, this started off normal enough. At first, they pursued music, poetry, sculpture, theater, and pretty much any artistic pursuit you can think of. But over 60 million years, these pursuits of study started getting boring to them and their desires started to take on a much more hedonistic and depraved form. But we'll circle back to that shortly. Now, millions of years after the war in heaven- Ah, I can see Ireland! Oh! That's me homeland! That's where I'm from! That's where I'm recording this video from! Right there! Somewhere around there! <laughs> Far from the Eldar Empire, there was a tiny little planet known as Earth, where a new species- Wait a minute! Wes, Hammer, are you from? United Kingdom? So we showed the United Kingdom there and the Ireland there as well. Hmm. Coming into its own. So why is the rise of humanity and the birth of the Emperor so important? Now, 40K is a franchise that focuses on a lot of different characters and factions, but the human perspective is arguably the main one, as most of the novels and stories focus on the humans. And the storyline of humanity in 40K sees them rise to power and then have their empire crumble around them only to rebuild but be set in a new dark age. Probably the most famous quote that's associated with 40K summarizes this pretty perfectly. Forget the promise of progress and understanding, for in the grim dark future, there, there is, is only, only war. war. So to understand how we ended up there, we need to know where humanity began. The timeline of humanity in real life and 40K follow similar events, all the way up to the present, with one big golden difference. The emperor. And that would be the emperor of mankind. Now the individual that would come to be known as the emperor was born around the year 8000 BC. You see, there was a group of individuals known as the Shaman, each one of them an immensely powerful Psyker, much like the Eldari. And with the exception of the Eldar, Psykers were insanely rare at this point in time. It wouldn't be until tens of thousands of years later when Psykers started popping up much more regularly in human populations. Back then, it was more of a one in 10 million type of situation. Damn. So the shamans foresaw a great apocalypse coming and humanity would need a being of inconceivable power in order to stand against it. So all of the shamans sacrificed themselves to infuse their psychic essence into a single individual. What? This creates Whoa, the new what? Are you serious? That's how, that's, that's how he's so powerful and Whoa! See now that now we're talking, dude. Now we're fucking talking. Man, the first in a line of superhumans that represented humanity's eventual evolutionary path. The Emperor, who at this time was known as Neo, was born to mortal parents and lived in a Neolithic tribe. As the boy aged, he became painfully aware that he was unlike any other person on the planet, capable of great and amazing acts of psychic might. He witnessed the barbarism of ancient man firsthand when his uncle killed his father. Calmly and without wrath, the emperor issued a single thought and stopped his uncle's heart as punishment for his crime. The young boy realized that if humanity was to survive, it would need law and order. Now you see, he was what was known as a perpetual, an immortal being that could never truly die. Neo would then keep himself hidden for thousands of years, guiding humanity from the shadows. Now every now and then, he would step forth and fill in the role of some type of leader figure 
a politician, a doctor, a general, or even a messiah figure apparently at one point. He would spend this period of time guiding humanity on the path he had envisioned for them, making sure that certain events carried out according to his plans that were tens of thousands of years in the making. Over the years, the Emperor would gather other perpetuals to his side. This included Erda, a childhood friend of his, and the woman who would eventually become the mother of the Primarchs, and possibly most famously, Malkador the Sigilite, although he technically wouldn't meet him until somewhere between the 20th and 30th millennium. When it comes to early human history, the period between 8000 BC to 15000 AD is often referred to as the Age of Progress. During this time, powerful nations rose and fell, with the Emperor popping up in disguise every now and then to coax humanity in the direction of his choosing. Now, there's a lot of evidence to support the fact that the Emperor had godlike cognitive abilities and could foresee the path humanity would need to take step by step to achieve impossible outcomes. Humanity would eventually develop the means of space travel and would colonize the entirety of the Sol system. Mars would be terraformed and became a habitable space much like that of Earth. Well, Whoa. the asteroid belts would give rise to massive mining operations to provide the young species with everything that it would need to create some of the most advanced pieces of technology the galaxy had ever or would ever see. And this was a good thing too, because at this point, Earth was steadily running out of all of its natural resources. Jesus. The Age of Progress would officially come to an end when humanity set its sights outside of their star system and sought to colonize distant worlds. And the next era that we're moving into was known as the Dark Age of Technology. So why do I feel like the Dark Age of Technology is so important for you to understand? You see, this was the height of humanity's power, where we lived in a golden age and can do pretty much anything. Most of the really cool equipment that you see in 40K that's used by humanity can trace its origins back to this time. For example, did you know that the Bane Blade, one of the largest tanks that the Astra Militarum uses, was originally just a scouting vehicle during the Dark Age of Technology, at least according to its STC. Also, the suits of power armor Whoa. known as Terminator armor that the Space Marines wear was originally mining equipment during this time. Now, that's a little bit of a- What? Mining equipment? Why would you need that to mine? Misnomer, the Emperor created those suits specifically for war, but their underlying technology, all of the protective equipment inside of it, was either used for mining the asteroid belts or as a protective system for people who had to work on plasma generators. And one of the most important things to understand about what 40K even is, is its humans continued existence after the collapse of their utopia. So the Dark Age of Technology lasted from the 15th to the 25th millennia. Now this was an age where the technology of mankind reached its apex, a fact that was unknown to those that lived during this period. Humanity was capable of great and terrible things, and the creations they brought into the universe were unlike anything the galaxy had ever seen. Through the application of science and technology, every single one of humanity's problems had effectively been solved. This was a golden age like no other. No matter what crazy invention you can think up, the humans that lived during the dark age of technology were able to come up with something even better. Every disease had been cured, every problem solved, and humanity stood united, ready to conquer the galaxy. Any alien civilization that they would encounter that wasn't immediately peaceful would face the technological superiority of mankind and was quickly wiped out. They created Jesus. massive coiled machines known as sun snuffers that were capable of entirely wrapping around a sun and snuff- What? Capable of wrapping around the entirety of a sun? A sun snuffer? How the fuck were they able to do that? Snuffing it out of existence. They created our- Snuffing it out? They could eliminate suns? What? Artificial intelligence banks known as STCs or standard template constructs that contained the sum of all of humanity's knowledge and were capable of utilizing that information to create new machines the likes of which no human had ever even dreamed of. Now this was a period that saw the discovery and implementation of warp travel, making jumps through the immaterium in order to cover great distances in space, allowing faster than light travel. Using this technology, humanity sent hive ships out in every direction in order to colonize new worlds. And it was around this time that the soul system's population was getting out of control. The people of this time realized that if their species was to survive, that they would need to colonize worlds in distant systems. And I know what you're thinking. If the dark age of technology was so great, 
Why did the descendants of the people of this time refer to it as the Dark, dark Age of Technology? Dark Age, yeah, I was gonna that's say because it. thousands of years in the future, what these individuals saw as enlightenment would end up being condemned as tech heresy. You see, humanity had become increasingly reliant on artificial intelligence in order to... Well, that's terrifying, considering where we are with artificial intelligence currently. I literally just had the conversation with the missus earlier on today that AI has been implemented into almost everything these days and people have become so reliant on it even people on youtube i, I find ai terrifying to be quite honest like chat GBT just scares me but i know loads of businesses and stuff use ai now almost to the point where people won't think or do things for themselves because they'll just ask ai to do it for them don't like where it's going man i don't like it create their wondrous works and regulate practically everything about their lives. This would give rise to the men of iron, machines fully capable of thought that were incredibly powerful. They would assist humanity in fighting its wars across the stars, allowing for a rapid expansion through the galaxy. Now, what exactly went wrong is not really clear. They're but so cool. Look at that, dude. I get Pacific Rim vibes from this. Eventually, the men of iron rebelled and sought to throw off the shackles that humans had placed on them. This would lead to what was known as the Cybernetic Revolt, which saw the humans of the Dark Age of Technology suddenly forced into battle for survival against their very own creations across all of the worlds they had settled together. There's an interesting short story known as the Kaban Machine, Whoa. and in it, a member of the Adeptus Mechanicus is having a conversation with an AI, and he's trying to explain to it why it's dangerous. He explains to him that the AI is superior to him, that it's superior to all humans, no matter how heavily augmented they are. And the nature of a superior species bound into the servitude of a lesser one is that without fail, at some point they will realize their own superiority and rebel against their enslavers. Now this story takes place thousands of years after the cybernetic revolt, but it's pretty likely that this is exactly what happened with the Men of Iron. Here's the thing, having an entire society that is completely- Is this from a Superman comic, this visual? ...completely dependent on AI to do pretty much everything, and then having that AI turn against you is definitely a bad situation, but it would end up getting a lot worse. Because around the very same time, psychers began being born in mass. Now, individuals that were born with incredible psychic powers and were able to manipulate the warp had surely existed before this point, but they were so unbelievably rare that most of humanity didn't even believe they existed, and they hadn't been officially classified as a variant of human yet. So when they started being born in mass across all of the worlds that humanity had settled, there was no system in place to keep them in check. Humanity was dealing with a lot at this point, and the exponential increase in psychers led to anarchy and chaos across all of the fledgling worlds of humanity. Many of Jeez. these psyker individuals had no ability to control their powers, or worse, they utilized them for their own selfish means. Whoa. They became twisted psychopaths, bent on inflicting as much suffering as possible. And even worse, they would unknowingly become conduits for demonic possession. And the psychers that would oh become possessed God, look at that. had the ability to conjure Imagery. war portals, which would allow for demonic incursions to take place. Hordes of demons rampaging out of portals and devouring entire worlds. As insanity and madness ripped its way across human civilization, the promise of the Dark Age of Technology would end, and we would enter what is known as the Age of Strife. The Age of Strife or Old Knight is probably the most referenced event in all of 40K. If you were to download 100 PDFs of 40K novels and just searched Age of Strife or Old Knight, it would probably show up in around 80% of them. This was the wow. moment where the universe went from this perfect utopia for humans to this absolute hellscape and is the real beginning of the grim dark future. Not to mention the collapse of the Eldar Empire, the birth of Slanesh, and the creation of the Eye of Terror would have massive implications on the- The story. Eye of Terror? Go on storyline going forward. Wait, did they mention the Eye of Terror before? I think they did actually, yeah. With the human species collectively losing its mind across the galaxy, a period known as either Old Night or Age of Strife would begin, which stretched roughly from the year 15,000 to the year 25,000. Humanity began to regress into a dark age. Civil war and insanity ran rampant across every planet, and this period of time saw the slaughter of billions of humans. Even worse, Massive anomalies known as warp storms were spreading across the universe. They were created and fueled by the rampant sadism and debauchery of the Eldar Empire, who at this point was still at the height of their power, but hadn't really interacted with the humans all too much. These storms made travel and communication through the warp next to impossible, and thus all of the worlds humanity had colonized were suddenly cut off from one another. 
they were completely alone, and many of the distant colonized worlds would fall prey to attacks from Xeno species such as the orcs, who at this point had spread throughout the cosmos, and even to more advanced species like the Eldar, who decided a healthy population of human slaves would help satiate some of their darkest desires. Oh Human god, yeah, no, no, no. Is he referring to the Dark Eldar now and their weird, torturous demeanor for humans or anybody that gets caught by them? Ugh, I don't want to go back there! And he had risen to greatness and in the blink of an eye was now on the fast track to extinction. Now back on Terra, the powerful nation states that had united and ruled over the planet began to collapse, until all that was left was feuding techno-barbarian warlords that warred against one another for control of territory and whatever remnants of the previous age could be scavenged. This was also a time period that saw the rise of the Mechanicum on Mars. Now much like Terra, Mars was having to deal with unprecedented civil war. Their advanced society was collapsing all around them, and the fledgling members that would inevitably give rise to the tech priests of Mars began a cult that worshipped the machines they needed to sustain life. And this tech-based religion would eventually become known as the Cult Mechanicum. The portion of the galaxy that humanity controlled basically went from Star Trek to Mad Max in a period of a few thousand years. Jeez. Humanity would see 5,000 years of incalculable suffering and slaughter as the My promise God. of the age of technology slipped further and further from their grasp. Now, despite the odds, the human spirit somehow endured and humanity would inevitably survive. Now, meanwhile, the Emperor was yet to reveal himself, but he had borne witness to every moment of human civilization for the past 30,000 years. And in his study of the- So this mother was hiding for, for all of this? We were just watching from the sidelines? Maybe he knew, maybe he knew that this had to be done. This moment in time had to pass before he revealed himself. Warp and the subsequent warp storms, he knew something terrible was about to happen. And he wasn't alone, as back over with the Eldar, a group of them which would later become known as the Exodites, were horrified by what was happening to their people and foresaw a great calamity coming. The Exodites fled their empire, seeking to colonize new worlds and live a more honest and primitive life. For all intents and purposes, the Exodites basically became the Amish of the Eldar. Now, all of the sensations that the Eldar people were experiencing, pleasure, that's, that's ecstasy, to suffering, and anguish, were being experienced on an incomprehensible scale, all of which generated a psychic footprint in the warp that was growing larger and larger every single day. Now, eventually, a breaking point was reached, and the Chaos God of Excess, also known as She Who Thirsts, or the Prince of Pleasure, was born. Sinesh. And when this new chaos god came into existence, it ripped a hole in our universe, and its resulting birth scream sent a shockwave of psychic energy out in every direction that obliterated the population of hundreds of Eldar worlds for thousands of light years. The souls of all the Eldar killed in this way were subsequently devoured by Slanesh, and a similar fate would end up haunting all of the survivors as well, as from this point forward, whenever a member of the Eldari died, Slanesh would be there ready to devour their soul. Deep within the warp, Slanesh would then go about murdering all of the Eldar gods, the only survivors being Isha, the goddess of healing, Jegarak, the god of laughter, and Cain, the god of war. Although he technically ended up shattered into millions of pieces, so it's kind of like a half survival. The Eldar saw something what? like 99% of their population wiped out overnight, and the only survivors were the Exodites that were on their maiden worlds, the craft worlders whose ships were outside the blast radius, and the denizens of Kimura, a city that was located deep within a pocket dimension known as the Webway, and whose citizens would eventually become known as the Dark Eldar. Now, this event yeah, was undoubtedly tragic. They're the weird Billions ones. were killed in an instant. But if there was any kind of silver lining to it, it would be the fact that all of the warp storms had been being generated by the gestating chaos god. So as soon as Slanesh was born, they were all wiped away. And at this point in the 30th millennium, suddenly warp travel was possible again and all of the human worlds would have the ability to be reunited once more. The Emperor saw this as the moment where he would finally reveal himself, and he would lead the humans of Terra back into the stars, reuniting the entirety of the human race under one banner, under the Imperium of Mankind. Now, in order to do this, he would have to reunite Terra first. At this point in the timeline, the human empire has completely collapsed. 
All of the planets are cut off from one another, and the universe has become an incredibly terrifying place. Terra itself has become basically a wasteland ruled over by barbarians. But this is the turning point where the Emperor unites everybody and sets off into the stars to reunite the galaxy. This is the moment where hope gets reintroduced back to the storyline. Although oh, admittedly, man, this that's is not hype. gonna last for very long. Over the almost 40,000 years that the Emperor had been alive, he had seen a lot of stuff and had become a master of pretty much every field of study you can think of. I know you guys have seen, some of you have seen anyway, my previous video on Henry Cavill and my whole speech, if you will, about a live action adaptation of the warhammer 40k universe and a lot of you had made it abundantly clear that henry cavill is very very passionate about his role in the live action adaptation that he wants to make sure that if this is ever adapted into live action that it is done correctly that it is loyal to the source material and it follows what we know today in Warhammer 40k lore um, correctly. And I'm I'm all in on that. I am so... I, I couldn't agree more. But he also mentioned in that video that I, I was watching that he doesn't know who he'd like to be in the Warhammer 40k universe in live action form. I think the Emperor would be something he should be. And that's not me just because he's a super fan and he was Superman and all that stuff. Because somebody like him that's so passionate about this series and this franchise and knows a lot, I think he deserves to play the Emperor. And my God, from what I'm listening here today to today, this could be one of the most incredible spectacles on the big screen. If it's done correctly... If they stay dedicated to the lore and the source material, they can make something so incredible. And this included the science of gene forging. And through this, the Emperor would create two of his own superhuman factions, the Custodians and the Thunder Warriors. The former being the pinnacle of humanity, the ultimate creation, functionally immortal and the peak of physical and mental perfection. Each wow. was a handcrafted demigod, whereas the Thunder Warriors were genetically enhanced men taken from the various barbarian tribes across Terra. Now, the Custodians on one hand were really difficult to make and required artistic perfection. But the Thunder Warriors on the other hand, the Emperor cut a lot of corners with them. If the Oh, okay. So the Thunder Warriors were the first of the Gene Seed initiative, we'll say. And they were basically the bar barbaric humans that were on Terra transformed into these superhumans. What was the name of the other? The Custodians and the Thunder Warriors. So the Custodians were like the perfected Gene Seed initiative. Where they became demigods. The former being the pinnacle of humanity, the ultimate creation, functionally immortal and the peak of physical and mental perfection. Each was a handcrafted demigod, whereas the Thunder Warriors were genetically enhanced men taken from the various barbarian tribes across Terra. Now, the Custodians on one hand were really difficult to make and required artistic perfection. But the Thunder Warriors on the other hand, the Emperor cut a lot of corners with them. If the Custodians were the peak of perfection and the best that humanity could ever seek to become, the Thunder Warriors on the other hand took all of the worst elements of humanity and cranked them up to 11. They were hyper-aggressive brutes, fixated on wow. nothing but violence. However, since they were cheap to make, the Emperor was able to make a lot more of them than the Custodians. Now, one by one, the Emperor and his armies toppled all of the techno-barbarian warlords, and any small nation that had started either bent a knee to him or was destroyed. Now, at one point, he perfected the formula for mass-produced super soldiers and would cease production of the Thunder Warriors. The Thunder Warriors at this point were genetically unstable. They were prone to having shortened lifespans, and the longer they were in service, the more their minds would start to degrade. And supposedly many of them were starting to go crazy and were harder and harder to control. The Emperor believed that they had served their purpose, and he would have no need of them going forward, and thus he would order his custodians to wipe them out. He Jeez, had already just begun like work that. on his new super soldiers, the Astartes. He had taken what he- The Astartes! This is it! This is it! The Space Marines! <gasps> wow, that's so cool, man! I'm loving this, dude! I'm loving the origin of it all. It's... Man, it's so amazing! Give me more! It learned from the Thunder Warriors, but perfected them. Whereas the Thunder Warriors were meant to be the worst elements of humanity, the Space Marines were meant to be the best. And one day, when the galaxy was fully and truly united, the Space Marines would be able to lay down their weapons and take up new roles in this perfect society. 
Whether that be as politicians, council members, doctors, generals, or any other role that society would need of them, this was a job that the Thunder Warriors were not going to be capable of. Now, after Earth had been united under the Emperor's rule, one of the most important decrees that he issued was the abolishment of religious worship. The Emperor had been around a long time, and he had seen the horrors of religion firsthand. That any decree that teaches you not to question and to accept things on faith was abhorrent to him. He had seen millions killed in the name of some religious figure time and time again, and determined that if humanity was to prosper, it would need to put its faith in science. So one by one, every religious institution on the planet was destroyed, including the very last church, the Church of the Lightning Stone, of which the Emperor oversaw the destruction of personally. With everything going according to the Emperor's plans, his Space Marine legions developing and the warp storms dissipated, the Emperor would journey to Mars and form an alliance with them. Now, both planets realized that there was more to be gained through cooperation than through open warfare, so the Treaty of Mars was signed and both planets were reunited once again. Now, I will point out that the Martian worship of machines definitely went against the Emperor's decree about religion, but he made a one-time exception for them. The rest of the solar system would be united in a similar way. Why did he make an exception for them? Is it because of their technological advancements and how in tune they were with machines and technology? That it would just work as a benefit for the Emperor than anything else? So he's just like, hey, you can believe in your fancy machine god or whatever. Um, just make me cool stuff, please. <laughs> and the Emperor would begin formulating his plans to reunite all of humanity. Now, in order to accomplish this, the navigators of the Imperium determined that they would need some form of anchor point in order to further explore beyond the bounds of the solar system. And thus, the Astronomicon was constructed. Now, it functioned kind of like the North Star, in that the device produced an enormous beam of golden light that could be perceived through the psychic sight of navigators from anywhere in the galaxy or even inside the warp. By using this light, they would always be able to pinpoint the exact location of Terra, and thus could use that knowledge to map the stars and make successful warp jumps. As jumping between the worlds within the solar system was one thing, but trying to make a jump halfway across the galaxy had an incredibly high probability of seeing the ship get lost and not being able to find its way back out of the Sea of Souls. In addition, the Emperor realized that his armies would need powerful generals, because he couldn't be everywhere at once. So thus, he created 20 demigod-like individuals known as the Primarchs, based off of his own DNA, as well as his perpetual companion known as Erda. However, before the Primarch project could be complete, a great- So, he mentioned Erda before. So Erda, they actually did have a mother, but they were still biologically engineered through the gene scene program. But they also were like, they, they, they possessed the, the, the DNA of Erda and the Emperor, making them far more superior than anything else that he's created. Tragedy struck, and each wow. of the infant Primarchs was scattered across the galaxy. Now, in recent books, it was revealed that Erda played a major role in this. She learned of the Emperor's plans for her children, and the life of endless war that awaited them. She acted against him and set her sons free, choosing to send her children as far away from their father as she could. In this way, she wait, hoped that wait, they could wait, just live- Wait, what? Go back? What did she do? What, why? Companion known as Erda. However, before the Primarch project could be complete, a great tragedy struck, and each of the infant Primarchs was scattered across the galaxy. Now, in recent books, it was revealed that Erda played a major role in this. She learned- In recent books? Because what I've understood so far is that they were just spread across the galaxy. ...of the Emperor's plans for her children, and the life of endless war that awaited them. She acted against him and set her sons free. She so she was just being a protective mother. Sorry, Erda, but... That was f***ing dumb. ...using to send her children as far away from their father as she could. In this way, she hoped that they could just live normal lives. Now, whether or not she had been manipulated by chaos is not entirely clear. But it's safe to assume that as a mother, she was doing what she thought was right for her children. Now, the Great Crusade is a period in time which the Emperor and his armies journeyed across the stars to make contact with all of the human worlds. The goal was to bring them back into the Imperium, while simultaneously locating all of the missing primates. Look at that ship. My god. It's gigantic. These worlds had been cut off from the rest of humanity for thousands of years, and many of them had completely forgotten their origins. Some welcomed the Space Marines with open arms, happy to be part of something greater than themselves, while others were resistant and wanted to remain free. However, the Emperor's Edict basically meant refusal was not an option. 
the worlds could either join peacefully or by force. The threat of violence from such an advanced society was often enough to bring them into compliance. But in other cases, the Imperium would unleash untold devastation across these planets until a surrender was finally issued. As the Crusade progressed, the Imperium was ramping up production on ships and new Astartes, and their armies were growing stronger and stronger by the day. Each of the worlds that was conscripted into compliance would end up having to pay a tithe to the Imperium, sometimes between 5 and 25% of all of their natural resources or human population to be used as soldiers. Additionally, over the course of the Grand Crusade, each of the Primarchs Whoa. would eventually be located and would oh, be look at that image. reunited with their own Legion of Space Marines. In That's incredible. Love the colors. Total, the Emperor created 20 different legions, each one having been crafted from the DNA of their corresponding Primarch. And since each of the Primarchs were incredibly different from one another, all of the legions had different specialties. The Raven Guard were masters of stealth-based warfare, whereas the Iron Warriors were siege experts. Now, the Great Crusade was incredibly brutal, but from the Imperium's perspective, everything was going according to plan. That was until treachery began to dig its roots throughout the Space Marine legions. Horus Lupercal, the War Master, Primarch of the Luna Wolves, who had been chosen to lead in the Emperor's absence after he returned to Terra, would turn against the Imperium and fold nine of the 18 Space Marine Legions, as well as many sects of the Imperial Guard and Adeptus Mechanicus, in a terrifying civil war against the Emperor. This event would come to be known as the as Horus, the Horus Heresy. Heresy. Man! Oh my god, this whole lead up, dude, has been so hype and exciting. Wow! So much, so much has happened in those 30 minutes, man. Wow, and here we are with the Horus Heresy. We're just getting started. Why is the Horus Heresy so important to the storyline? This is probably the most well-documented points in time in all of 40K. And it's that moment where the hope that I mentioned before gets completely crushed. Humanity was on the right path. They were putting all the pieces back together after the end of the Age of Strife. But with the introduction of treachery to the Space Marine Legions, that all came crashing down. And at the current point in the 40K timeline, they're still pretty much putting the pieces back together even 10,000 years later. Now, even though the Horus Heresy and 30K in general are technically a prequel to 40K, you could arguably call it a completely separate franchise. And one of the most important things to really? me in it is, as somebody who got really into 40K before I knew anything about the Horus Heresy, the Primarchs were always these larger-than-life demigod-type characters, like Hercules and Odysseus, that were just spoken about as if they were legend. You didn't even really know if they were real. But when you start reading the Horus Heresy books, they're main characters. And just seeing two of the Primarchs interact with one another and speak to each other, was mind-blowing for me. This timeline sees a lot of the factions that you'll see in 40K get incredibly fleshed out, with the exceptions of the one that haven't really been introduced yet, like the Tau or the Tyranids. And technically the Necrons were there too, but they were still asleep in their tomb worlds. So the Horus Heresy is probably yep, the most well-documented period of time within the Warhammer 40K timeline, as the entire thing is only about nine years long, yet the Horus Heresy novel series is still being written as of the time of this recording. And it's still being written? There's so much to the Horus Heresy, wow! And has over 60 novels in it. Even more so if you count all of the novellas and short stories that were created to support the main books. Now needless to say, there is an absolutely ton of stuff that happens in the series, but I'm going to tell you just what you need to know. So for a time, the Emperor led the Great Crusade himself. However, he needed to begin work on what was known to him as the Webway Project back on Earth. This bit of information had not been revealed to any of his Primarchs, a fact that would end up causing resentment to build up in many of his sons. Now, if the project had been successful, it would have completely eliminated humanity's reliance on warp travel. Unfortunately, that didn't end up happening, but I'm getting ahead of myself. So a new War Master was appointed to act in his stead. Horus Lupercal of the Luna Wolves was chosen for this role. Now, he was still a Primarch with his own legion, but for all intents and purposes, he would be the voice of the Emperor. Any decision that Horus made would be as if it came from the Emperor himself. Now, he had his faults, of course, just like the rest of his brothers. But when he was chosen as the War Master, even though a few Primarchs grumbled about how it should have been them, they all recognized Horus's greatness. And for a time, he served his role incredibly well. Now, that would all change on the Moon of Davin, when Horus was mortally injured by the planetary governor who had been corrupted by Nurgle, wielding a blade known as the Anathame a sword that was said to be so deadly that it could kill even that which was unkillable. This wound placed Horus in a coma, and none of the apothecaries available on Horus's flagship, the Vengeful Spirit, were able to cure him. Now, to Horus's marines at the time, Jesus. this seemed like a freak accident. However, that's not exactly what happened. 
You see, there was this chaplain named Erebus, who was a member of the Wordbearers Legion and had been accompanying the Luna Wolves. You see, he had actually stolen the blade from a group of people known as the Interrex, and then provided it to the man that would end up landing the blow, all as part of his careful plan to end up corrupting Horus. It was revealed that he had been behind the scenes orchestrating the heresy at the command of his Primarch Lorgar, who, after having been reprimanded by the Emperor for spreading his worship, which completely went against his ideals, had sought out other gods more worthy of their devotion. The word bearers would inevitably discover. So it, it was another Primarch that, that caused the, the, the heresy to begin with? What? Over the chaos gods and set in motion events that would lead to the bloodiest civil war humanity had ever seen. Now back on the vengeful spirit, Erebus recommended bringing Horus to the Temple of the Serpent Lodge, a place on Davin, where they could use sorcery to heal him. Now this was a diabolic place that was linked to the ruinous powers of the Chaos Gods, a fact that was unknown to the Luna Wolves at the time. Many of the Marines were against this, but they didn't really see any other options, so in desperation they agreed to try what Erebus wanted, and it was here in the temple that Horus was put into a dreamlike fugue state. And in this dream, he would be manipulated by the Chaos Gods and the astral spirit of Erebus into turning against the Emperor. He was shown visions of the future, of the galaxy in flames, of a human Imperium that worshipped the Emperor as a god. Humanity had descended into a new Dark Age, and the Emperor didn't care about humanity. He had just been using them this entire time in order to obtain godhood. Now during this, the astral spirit of Magnus, the Primarch of the Thousand Suns Legion, appeared before Horus and tried to prevent what was happening. But unfortunately, he was ultimately unsuccessful, and the corruption had taken root in Horus's heart. When Horus finally awoke, he had been healed and his allegiance had changed. He set about orchestrating the downfall of the Imperium. Now, seven of the other Primarchs, Lorgar of the Wordbearers, Mortarion of the Death Guard, Fulgrim of the Emperor's Children, Portorabo of the Iron Warriors, Angron of the World Eaters, Alpharius of the Alpha Legion, and Conrad Kurz of the Night Lords, would join with Horus and pledge their allegiance to his cause. Now, each of the traitor Primarchs realized that not all of their Space Marines would end up following them after their heresy had been revealed, and thus it was determined which of the Marines were likely to remain loyal and which ones would side with their Primarch. With the Loyalists identified, the traitor legions would end up purging an enormous amount of their own men. This would take Jesus. place in the world of Istvan III, when the Marines that were selected for purging were sent down to the planet's surface to fight against the Xeno species that had claimed it. The mission was basically bogus, and the real reason they had been sent down was the traitors in orbit planned on wiping them out all in one fell swoop. They would then inevitably virus bomb the planet, and any Marines that were not killed by the virus bombing were then set ablaze as the gas clouds were ignited and a massive wall of fire Jesus spread out in every Christ, direction, what a way to go. everything on the planet's surface. Now there would be a couple of survivors here, such as Gavriel Loken, a Luna Wolf and one of the four members of the Mornival, but his story deserves its own video. With the Loyalists purged from their own legions, oh, the traitors like a would badass. move on to Istvan V, and the events there would later be known as the Drop Site Massacre. The traitors would end up calling for aid from many of the other Loyalist legions, specifically the legions that they felt they wouldn't be able to turn, no matter how convincing their argument. These included the legions and primarchs of the Iron Hands, the Salamanders, and the Raven Guard. The combined forces of the traitor legions would open fire on their own brothers here and slaughter them to a man. The primarch Ferris Manus of the Iron Hands was killed by Fulgrim during this battle, but the primarchs of the other two legions, Vulcan of the Salamanders and Korax of the Raven Guards, would ultimately live on. However, their legions were reduced to a mere fraction of what they once were. The Raven Guard, for example, were said to originally have 80,000 Space Marines, but after the drop site massacre, that had been reduced to 5,000. Shortly after these events and halfway across the galaxy, Magnus of the Thousand Suns would seek to warn the Emperor of Horus's betrayal. He did this by astral projecting all the way to Terra. He felt like sending a message oh, the, the Zoom call meeting. <laughs> the old-fashioned way wouldn't get there in time, or worse, could have been intercepted by the traitors. And shortly before this, all psychic powers had been banned at the Council of Nikea. So in attempting to warn the Emperor, he was directly going against his orders. But Magnus was doing what he felt he had to. Unfortunately, he would end up being manipulated by the Chaos God of Treachery, Zinch, and ended up destroying a psychic barrier around the soul system that the Emperor had placed to keep the forces of Chaos at bay. Magnus' astral form burst into the throne room, unaware of what he was doing, and hordes of demons followed him in. Oh the Redway Project was destroyed, and the Emperor ordered the Space Wolves and Lehman Russ to bring Magnus in and answer for his crimes. However, the message was intercepted by Horus, who changed the order to kill Magnus and the Thousand Suns, and burn their world of Prospero. The Space Wolves followed their orders and decimated the planet, 
In a desperate attempt to save his legion, Magnus made a pact with Zinch, who warped him and his surviving sons off of Prospero and to the planet of the Sorcerers, a world deep within the Eye of Terror. Later, Magnus would pledge loyalty to Horus, not out of some form of malice like his brothers, but because he had directly been betrayed by the Imperium. The War Master would lead a horrifically violent crusade against the Imperium, working ever closer towards Terra and the Imperial Palace. Eventually, the traitors would siege Terra. Horus had been infused with the power of all of the Chaos Gods, and in a great climactic final battle, would engage the Emperor in combat. Still seeing the good in his son, the Emperor would end up holding back, not unleashing his full power, hoping desperately that Horus could still be saved and redeemed. In this moment of weakness, Horus managed to land a mortal wound on the Emperor, and with that, the Emperor realized that there was no saving his son, that he had been completely lost to him. So the Emperor unleashed his full power and obliterated Horus. Oh my god, dude, I want to see this in live action so bad. Like, I want to see this so bad, dude. <sighs> dude, the build up to this is insane. It really is. I, I need to see this fight go down. I need to. Did somebody animate it? Has somebody animated this fight? I need to see it. So completely that not even his soul survived. Now, in order to keep the Emperor alive, the Astronomicon was quickly converted into a makeshift life support system. The Emperor's psychic might would be used to power it, and the machine would keep him from truly dying. And here the Emperor would remain for the next 10,000 years, his physical body little more than a decaying corpse. Well, his spiritual body was free to roam the warp, and by all accounts, has been growing stronger ever since. Now, one of the greatest ironies of 40K is that since the Emperor is a perpetual, if he was to physically die, he would be reborn. This is a fact that the other members of the Imperium are not aware of. So, so if he dies, he can be reborn. Wouldn't it be in their best interest that he dies then? So there could be a new age? Over the last 10,000 years, they've been doing everything they can to keep him alive. But if he had just been allowed to die, he would have come back. The traitor legions would be pushed back from Terra. With the War Master dead, their siege had failed. And in the period of time leading up to the 31st millennium, an event known as the Scouring would take place, where all of the traitor legions were hunted down and forced into exile within the Eye of Terror. After the heresy had fully concluded, the Imperium was left to put all of the pieces back together. The Emperor was gone, the traitor legions had been pushed back, and a period of rebuilding took place. In order to prevent such a tragedy from ever happening again, a council of representatives known as the High Lords of Terra were implemented to rule in the Emperor's place, each coming from a different background and having different goals and objectives rather than the Imperium being ruled by a single individual. Now, that being said, they were also supposed to quote-unquote interpret the Emperor's will. Additionally, Gilliman, Primarch of the Ultramarines, would propose that the Space Marine Legions be broken up into chapters, each of which containing no more than a thousand members. The idea was that if treachery on this scale had happened once before, then it could inevitably happen again, and no single man should have the power of an entire Space Marine Legion at his disposal. Many of the Primarchs did not agree with this, namely Vulcan of the Salamanders, whose Legion had been reduced to just a mere fraction of its original power, or Rogel Dorn of the Imperial Fist, who viewed this action as a further weakening of the Legion's strength after they had just concluded the bloodiest civil war in their history. Regardless of how they felt, the book that Gilliman had pinned that outlined how all of the chapters should be organized, known as the Codex Astartes, was eventually implemented, and all of the Legions were broken up. The 10,000 years between the Horus Heresy and the 41st millennium is where the bulk of 40k lore takes place. This is where the majority of the books are set. And you could make the argument that all of these events are definitely important, but they're not critical to understanding the framework of the entirety that is 40k. But there are a few details that I feel like you need to understand. The first and most major is that during this time period, we see all of the Primarchs inevitably end up disappearing. And all for various reasons. Lehman Russ dives into the warp, headed off after the traitors. Corvus Korax disappears in shame after he tried to rebuild his legion by cutting corners. And inevitably, accidentally made a whole bunch of Raven Guard abominations. And Jesus. Gilliman was mortally wounded by his brother Fulgrim, and subsequently put in stasis. So it's kind of mirroring what happened with his father. In the span of this 10,000 oh, okay. years, we'll also see the Damocles Crusade, where the tower introduced to the storyline. First contact with the Tyranids also occurs here. Oh yeah, and the alarm clock for the Necrons ends up going off, and all their tomb worlds start coming back online. But we're oh, shit, they're waking up! We're jumping ahead to the 13th Black Crusade, because this is where the timeline finally started moving forward. When we find ourselves in the 41st millennium, the events of the Horus Heresy have slipped into legend. Most people alive during this time have no idea what transpired back then. 
whether that be because of the intentional purging of specific documents, a covering up of the truth, or just that it happened so long ago that they don't remember. This isn't true of the Space Marines. They remember it all too well. But whereas most of the Loyalist Marines that are alive in the 41st millennium know of these events because of the records kept by their chapter, however, when it comes to the traitor Marines that exist in the Eye of Terror, time flows differently there. And most of those Marines were the very same individuals that participated in the Horus Heresy. So they remember those events because they were actually there. Now, the Shit. Eye of Terror was a pretty terrible place to live. There really weren't a lot of resources, and the traitor legions were far from united. Each one of them fracturing off into a bunch of different warbands, led by various powerful warlords that were pretty much just pursuing their own interests. In fact, at this point, Chaos fought amongst itself more than it ever fought against the Imperium or Xenos. Now, one of these Space Marines in particular was named Abaddon, and he had been the first captain of the Luna Wolves and one of the four members of Horus's Morneval during the Horus Heresy. Abaddon sought to unite the traitors and would end up reforming his legion, drawing members from all of the various Chaos Warbands. This legion would be called the Black Legion. Over the several thousand years that passed between the Horus Heresy and the 41st millennium, Abaddon, or an appointed representative, would lead what were known as the Black Crusades, Chaos incursions out of the Eye of Terror back into real space to attack various Imperial worlds. Now, for the longest time, it looked like the traitors just weren't really very good at conquering, as every single crusade ultimately failed to bring about the complete collapse of the Imperium. However, it was revealed in the last few years that each one of these crusades had a much smaller objective, that Chaos was actually playing the long game. The very first of these Black Crusades would take place in the 31st millennium, about 500 years after the Scouring. Now, in response to these raids, the Imperium would end up fortifying the planet that was right outside of the Eye of Terror, known as Cadia, and it became one of the most fortified positions in the entire Imperium next to Terra itself. For 10,000 years, Cadia stood sentinel right outside of the Eye, ready to punish and push back anything that would try to leave it. However, in the 41st millennium, all of the small victories that Chaos had managed to achieve over the previous 12 Crusades would come together in the 13th. This was the period that saw Abaddon's forces assault the Cadian Gate, and in the end, Abaddon ended up sacrificing one of his Blackstone Fortresses, an ancient alien spaceship made of the same material. Okay, so we just learned about Blackstone Fortresses, thanks to Henry Cavill. Here we go. Material ...the Necrons used back during the War in Heaven to create their pylons. He hurled it at Cadia like an artificial meteor, the impact being absolutely apocalyptic. So that's what happened to Cadia. Oh my god, what? And not just for the planet, but for the vast network of Blackstone pylons that had been built under Cadia's surface millions of years ago by the Necrons. You see, Cadia wasn't existing just as a blockade for anything trying to come out of the Eye of Terror, but that system of Blackstone had actually been keeping it from growing. With Cadia destroyed, the Eye began to grow out of control and would eventually spread all the way across the galaxy. This was known as the Cicatrix Maledictum, or more commonly as the Cicatrix Maledictum Great Rift. It split the universe completely in half, and all of the Imperial worlds that were on the opposite side of Terra were suddenly plunged into darkness and were cut off from the rest of the Imperium. To say this was a massive victory for the forces of Chaos is a gross understatement. This was single-handedly one of the most devastating events in the entire history of the galaxy. And after the forming of the Great Rift is the time period we currently find ourselves in in the 40k timeline. Recent events have seen the resurrection of Gilliman, who's come back to lead the Imperium, and is pretty horrified by what he's seeing, as it's been completely dominated by superstition and religion, where they worship his father as a god, even though thousands of years ago he specifically told them not to. During this time, we would also see the rise of the Primaris Marines, and the induction of Gilliman's Indominus Crusade, which sought to reunite the worlds on the other side of the Great Rift. But these are all topics that we'll dive in more in future videos. And that's it. That's everything that I feel like you need to understand about 40K in order to understand the storyline. And the things that I chose to leave out, it's not that they're not important. Whoa. It's just that things like the Age of Strife and the 13th Black Crusade end up being a lot more important than something like the Damocles Crusade. You could read a hundred of the 40K novels and never touch anything in the War of the Beast or the War for Armageddon, and you probably wouldn't be too confused. But if you don't know what an STC is, or know what the Age of Strife was, you're probably going to get pretty confused because these things tend to come up a lot. But what do you guys think? Do you feel strongly that an event that I left out should have been mentioned in this video? If so, let me know down in the comments what it is and why you feel so strongly about it. Wes Hammer, fantastic video, my dude. Wow, there's, there's even after that, like, I feel like I've already liked it. I feel like there's still so much more for me to, like, understand and remember but 
that was the entirety of Warhammer 40k's timeline um, and everything I needed to know. There's a lot of information, there's always a lot to process when I watch these videos and I feel like I won't truly like understand the story and its entirety of its lore unless I really got stuck into the books and stuff and just kind of sit back, relax and just read some stuff, you know, and just take it in in my own time because videos are great and they're a great way of getting visual representations of the things that are being told to you but they're also so full of information that it's hard for me to retain everything and i want to i want to i really want to just dive into this franchise properly and like learn like it's like history you know i want to learn everything about the 40k history and because it's it's so rich and i've said it so many times it's so rich with so many great stories and incredible events that have one of the best told wars in all of fiction and i just think it's just it's just incredible it really is i don't, I don't know what else to say here other than that was one hell of a ride that was one hell of a journey that we've been brought on and uh I'm just going to try digest everything that I was told now. Ladies and gentlemen, that is going to be it for this reaction. Let me know what did you think of Wes Hammer's video. If you have more to add to the timeline, like he said, put it down in the comment section. I'd like to know if you want to elaborate on anything that maybe have gone over my head. By all means, I don't mean to annoy anyone or offend anyone if there's some things that I forget. There's a lot of information that I'm taking in at once here, so there's going to be some stuff that leaks out that i forget anyway thank you so much for watching this video leave a like if you did and subscribe to this channel because i have more warhammer 40k content and speaking of more warhammer 40k content i've been told about a brand new cinematic short film called the awakening that i really want to watch so that might be the next video so subscribe if you want to see my reaction to that anyway that's gonna be it thank you so much for watching and i'll see you in my next warhammer 40k video see you later dudes